For the first time in 19 months, the Supreme Court is holding in-person oral arguments. It's the start of the first new term under the new 6-3 to three conservative split. That means there can still be a conservative majority decision, even if Chief Justice John Roberts sides with the liberals. He did that in key cases focusing on abortion rights and Obamacare. But the new term also begins at a turbulent time for the court's reputation among the American public. In just two months, the Supreme Court's approval rating dropped nine points. It now sits at 40 percent, the lowest since Gallup began tracking it in 2000. The poll found three major unpopular decisions driving that drop, declining to block Texas's six-week abortion restrictions, striking down the CDC's eviction freeze and allowing colleges to mandate COVID vaccines. CBS News Chief Legal Correspondent Jan Crawford joins me now with more. Hi there, Jan. So in recent weeks, it's been interesting to watch. Four justices have tried to push back on the perception that the high court is a political entity. They are liberal Stephen Breyer, conservatives Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, and Amy Coney Barrett, who made her remarks at a venue named after Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. What cases are they making, Jan, and how could that impact the upcoming term? Well, as Justice Barrett said, we're not political hacks. And I mean, it's kind of colorful language, but I think they're all trying to get at the same point that, look, they have disagreements on how to interpret the law and how to interpret the Constitution. Justice Breyer, uh, being a liberal, is not going to see it the same way that Justice Thomas, the most conservative justice, does. Uh, but they're all in this struggle to try to find and interpret the laws based on the law, not necessarily what public opinion might want. And if you look at some of those polls, they're getting hit from all sides. I mean, the conservatives didn't like uh, the vaccine uh, mandate mandate that they refused to set aside. Liberals obviously didn't like that procedural ruling on the, the Texas abortion ban, which that is just at the early onset of that case. They haven't had the last word on that. The problem for the court, though, is that because you've got this hot political spotlight on it right now, uh, people are just assuming they're political. And so these justices are going out there saying, no, we're, we're trying to set our, you know, our opinions aside. We're following the law. There's so many cases this term, though, uh, that's going to put that to the test. And I think it's going to be a challenge. Uh, for them to not appear that way when they're going to disappoint people on both sides this term. Yeah, it's interesting. The Constitution permits Congress to decide how to organize the Supreme Court, giving a political body control over this um, supposedly non-political entity. So how does that impact the arguments from these justices? Well, you know, they've all spoken pretty forcefully against the idea of adding justices to the Supreme Court. Of course, President Biden has uh, created this commission, and that's under review right now. Uh, the justices across the board, on the left and the right, say that's a terrible idea. And if you look back historically, uh, presidents have found that, yeah, that was a pretty bad idea. The public doesn't support uh, playing around with the composition of the Supreme Court by the political branches. Those uh, recommendations are kind of under review right now by the Biden administration. So, you know, I think we'll see what they're, you know, going to issue at some point in the near future. Uh, but some believe that that's also kind of a way that they can hold this over the Supreme Court. Like, you guys better stay in line. Uh, don't get too far afield here on some of these decisions, because we may just add a few more justices if you don't do what we think you should do. And that's raising concerns among at least the conservative justices that there's an effort to manipulate uh, what they might do or try to get some of them to pull their punches on some of these rulings. Yeah, as we've talked about, several of the cases scheduled for this term will likely attract political focus. Which do you see, Jan, as the most consequential? You know, Elaine, any time that you have an abortion case, it's a big issue before the Supreme Court. But this case that they have this term is the most significant challenge to Roe versus Wade in a generation. You have to go back to 1992 until uh, you have this kind of a threat to Roe versus Wade. This is going to consume all of the commentary. I mean, it, no matter what was on the docket, uh, if you had this case, it was going to be a major contentious term. So this is, I think, going to consume everything, all the commentary, all the protests. That case is going to be our Argued in December, it takes a look at a Mississippi law that uh, bans abortions after 15 weeks. Uh, some people say, well, you know, that's kind of reasonable. I mean, that's not like Texas, which is saying they should ban them after six weeks. Uh, but the question is, how do you uphold that law and not overturn Roe versus Wade? And so Mississippi has asked the court to also, in addition to upholding that 15-week ban, 
to also overturn Roe versus Wade. With those six justices, conservative justices on the court, abortion opponents uh, who have fought against Roe versus Wade since it was decided in the 70s, 73, they think that's exactly what this court might do. The stakes, I think, could not be higher uh, for people on both sides of really what is the most divisive issue uh, in our country. They've got a couple other cases that are also hugely controversial. Uh, one involves gun rights and, and then a New York law about uh, being able to take a concealed weapon and out of your home for self-defense. Another one involves a religious rights and a tuition assistance program out of Maine and whether or not uh, it's the state can say that you know, no public funds can go to religious schools. But those cases, and affirmative action case, by the way, on the horizon, but those cases, again, um, while major con controversial cases, all of this is going to pale uh, in comparison to the, to the, the, the abortion case. I just, you cannot overstate the significance of that case. So, Jan, given the stakes that you just laid out, let's say if the majority rules to alter abortion rights, uh, what recourse do members of Congress or the president have? Well, a lot. I mean, and you were already, I think, seeing this movement not only in the states but also in Congress because people, again, on both sides believe that maybe this court might actually overturn Roe versus Wade for the first time. I mean, there's, it's, I think both sides are thinking that might happen. So you're seeing these kind of mostly conservative states pass laws that would either ban or greatly restrict abortion rights if Roe is overturned, and those are going to be ready to go if the Supreme Court overturns Roe. Those are obviously states that you might expect in the South, uh, kind of further out in the West, mostly conservative states. On the flip side, liberal states are passing laws that would allow abortion to remain legal in their states. And there's also an effort underway in Congress to kind of federalize the right to an abortion. Because obviously, remember, the Constitution, the Supreme Court said back in 1993, it's the Constitution that protects a woman's right to an abortion. Conservatives have never bought that argument. They say there's nothing in the Constitution about the right to an abortion. So if the Supreme Court agrees with that this time and says, we're overturning Roe, it's not grounded in the Constitution, that would just leave the issue up to the states. So if you're in New York, for example, if you're a woman, it, it wouldn't really affect you at all. But if you're in Mississippi or Alabama or Texas, those states might actually try to ban it. An incredibly um, emotional issue, a charged issue, um, one that certainly um, we know you're going to continue to track. Jan Crawford for us. Jan, great to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elaine.